King Lavana was hypnotized by a juggler. And during that one hour of hypnosis, he lived a whole life as a tribesman. And at the end of that life, it was such a miserable life that he abandoned his wife and kids and killed himself. And it seems he went to visit the scene of the hallucination and it turns out that all actually happened. So how did that work? Vasishta continued. In his hypnotic state, the king Lavana obviously saw reflected in his own consciousness the marriage of a prince with the tribal woman, etc. And he experienced it as if it happened to him. A man forgets what he did earlier in his life even, at, even if at that time he had devoted a lot of time and energy to that action. Even so, he now thinks that he did not do what he actually did. Such discrepancies in memory are often seen. Even as one sometimes dreams of a past incident, as if it happens now, Lavrana experienced in his vision some past incident connected with the tribesmen. It is possible that the people in the forests on the slopes of the Vindyas experienced in their own minds the visions that appeared in the consciousness of Lavana. It is also possible that Lavana and the tribesmen saw in their own minds whatever was experienced by the other. These hallucinations become reality when experienced by many, even as a statement made by very many people is accepted as true. When these are incorporated in one's life, they acquire their own reality. After all, what is the truth concerning the things of the world, except how they, how they are experienced in one's own consciousness? So there's some very interesting um, possibilities. There are some very interesting possibilities here. And it, it's... Uh, even more fascinating now in this world where we've got different cultures so exposed to each other through 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 the technology of modern communications. Um, <clears throat> and basically it's saying that reality is very much what people believe it to be. For example, most people believe <clears throat> that how you live now determines what happens to you after you die. You might believe in going to heaven or going to hell. <clears throat> you might believe that your soul takes on a new body. But it all depends on what's happened in this life. And uh, this, this, this can flavour whole cultures. It's... Uh, can determine how people live and um, if sufficient people say something happened then it becomes a, a, a taken as a fact you know sufficient people say that the the Virgin Mary gave birth to the Son of God then there are communities of people that will believe that um, there are people, there are communities of people, uh, smaller ones hopefully, that think that if you kill somebody who doesn't follow your belief, then God will reward you. So it's, we, we like to think that there's some kind of independent fact out there. It's quite necessary for our legal systems, isn't it, and for scientific the pursuit of scientific inquiry to have what we might call a set of established facts and we need to accept these facts so that we can make decisions as a society in terms of the directions in which we want to move forward so we do have to sort of act in accordance with the, the notion that there's a set of facts which we all agree with, basically. Uh, and it's in, we, have, we, have, we live in interesting times because exactly what facts we believe in uh, uh, is up for, up for debate. Um, 
what facts can we as human beings subscribe to in order for us to live harmoniously? It's an important question. But here it's uh, in the Yoga Vasishta, such facts are, are taken as arbitrary. They're, they're social conventions. They're not, they're not reality. There are no facts. Nescience is not a real entity, even as oil and sand is not a real entity. So saying here there's actually no such thing as ignorance. Nescience and the self cannot have any relationship, for there can be relationship only between same or similar entities. This is obvious in everyone's experience. Thus it is only because consciousness is infinite that everything in the universe becomes knowable. Our consciousness can be aware of anything. You know, there's an infinite number of things that can come into our awareness and therefore the nature of consciousness must be infinite. It is not as if the subject illumines the object which has no luminosity on its own. But since consciousness is all this, everything is self-luminous without requiring a perceiving intelligence. It is by the action of consciousness becoming aware of itself that intelligence manifests itself, not when consciousness apprehends an inert object. The assumption of science is that the universe is inert, there are things out there and we become aware of them through our perceptual process. And this is a pure assumption. It's a pure assumption. Um, and I think it's an assumption which science itself has come to challenge. It doesn't actually work when you when you take that when you follow that assumption through to its logical conclusion, uh, it begins to break down. So when consciousness is aware of something, all it can be aware of is consciousness. This is the point it's making here that only similar entities can be uh, in any kind of relationship with each other. It is not correct to say that there is a mixture in this universe of the sentient and the inert, for they do not mix. It is because, it is because all things are full of consciousness, and when this consciousness comprehends itself, there is knowledge. So everything is only consciousness interacting with itself. I'm just wondering why this follows on from what we were saying about Lavina. I suppose it, 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 if everything is this consciousness interacting with itself, then we're, what, what we're attacking, what's being attacked here is the, the notion of this external inert world. One may see a relationship between a tree and a rock, though they appear to be inert. But such relationship exists in their fundamental constituents, which have undergone a certain kind of change to become a tree and another to become a rock. This is also seen in the sense of taste. The taste buds in the tongue respond to the taste in the food, etc., because of their similarity in constitution. Yeah, the, the yoga for sisters and slightly the yoga for sisters is a slightly dodgy ground here. It seems to be suggesting that we taste food because our taste buds are, are similar to food. And it mentions the relationship between a tree and a rock because of the similarity of their underlying, their fundamental constituents. Although, again, it's interesting. Science makes the assumption that there is a fundamental unity. This is one of the assumptions that science makes. It seems to assume that there's all this difference going on. There's a difference between the observer and the observed. But there's this fundamental unity, which it tries to express. It's trying to find either in terms of a fundamental particle or, or, some, or the, the fundamental unity of all forces. 